Anyway, if you have your Bibles this morning, let's go to John chapter 1. Uh, we're going through, uh, we went through the Old Testament and uh, spent the year doing that and looking uh, at each of the books of the Old Testament. <clears throat> and not being a terribly clever person, I thought, well, let's do the same thing in the New Testament. <clears throat> so we're, uh, we're moving through uh, the uh, New Testament books and looking at the overarching themes of uh, each of the books of, of the New Testament. And uh, so today we're looking at the fourth gospel, the gospel of John. And I want us just to read what's called the prologue. We're not going to read the whole thing, but we're going to re read verses 1 through 3 and then jump down to verse 14. And then we'll kind of take a look at this. But uh, beginning in verse 1, John writes, In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of of grace and truth. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Now, uh, there's an old story that's been repeated by preachers in, over the years, but I like the story. And it's about a little boy <clears throat> who came in to his parents' bedroom after a bad dream, and you probably remember as a child coming in and you probably remember your own kids coming in after a bad dream, uh, and they want to sleep right in the middle, and you know they're about to ruin your night's sleep. And, uh, and so you try to find a reason to send them back to their bedroom. You know, and you find whatever answers you can come up with. And in this case, you know, uh, the little boy's mom looked at the fear in his eyes, and... Uh, she said to her little boy, you know, God is, God is with you. God is in your bedroom, and, and he's there. And at that point, the little boy told his mom, yeah, I know, but right now I need somebody with skin. <laughs> so when Jesus came to earth, he came as God in human skin to reveal just who God is to calm our fears just as a parent calms the fears of a child, to give us peace, to let us know that he is there, and to let us know that he loves us. Now, the Apostle John <clears throat> records the events of Jesus' earthly ministry. But more than just recording history, John is telling us something about Jesus. And therefore, he's telling us something about God. In fact, many readers of John have noticed that his narrative of Christ is really the most theological of all the Gospels. There's a lot of theology in the Gospel of John. Now, uh, <clears throat> to explain the why of all of this, we uh, need to realize that John wrote his Gospel in the same period of societal upheaval that saw the gospel of Mark and Luke come into existence, a period of intense persecution of Christians during the reign of, of Nero. But more than this, John is addressing a threat that was endangering the theological purity of the church. There was false doctrine that was coming in and pretending to be biblical doctrine. Early Gnosticism was already challenging the truth of the gospel as the apostles had received it from Christ. And many false teachers roamed the ancient world, attempting to place themselves under the protective umbrella of Christianity and professing, you know, we're one of you, while still teaching something far different from anything that Jesus ever taught. And these early Gnostic teachers all sounded very spiritual, but they were also very wrong. They tampered with the very nature of Jesus as God, 
claiming that God would never take on human flesh and that Jesus was only one God among many. The popular idea within the Greek uh, and Roman society of that day was just that spirit and matter can never mix. Uh, and uh, by the time John wrote, however, the Apostle Paul had already been beheaded and Peter had been crucified upside down, as tradition would say. And in their absence, it was now up to John to address these theological aberrations that threatened the biblical truth that Christ had entrusted to his apostles. So one purpose of John's gospel was not only to present the theological truth, but that this gospel would serve as a teaching resource to correct faulty ideas that were attempting to invade and infiltrate Christianity. To protect against these Gnostic ideas, it was necessary that John confront those ideas head on. And in John's gospel, we see Jesus drawing a distinction between his teaching and that of these false teachers. And one of the events that John picks out draws this distinction of the false teachers in the teachings of Jesus. In John 14, in verses 23 and 24, it says, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Then in verse 24, anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. You hear how John picks this particular event to point out the reality of these false teachers. He says, these words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. So Jesus came proclaiming a message of truth to, uh, to mankind. These false ideas that were threatening the church had already caused confusion in the church at Colossae. Paul had written to that problem, and we'll look at that later in the year. But the problem seemed to be spreading. And in some of the churches that John was dealing with, uh, it seemed that this Gnostic or early Gnostic heresy was spreading. Now, I think John was writing in the late 60s, just after the deaths of Paul and Peter. Now, some would say John wrote this much later. Um, uh, I think there's enough scholarship to indicate that it, that it happened. There's several well-known scholars who would date it in the late 60s rather than AD 85 or 95, and I agree with them. I could be wrong, but it's so seldom that I am. Just forget about it, okay? Anyway, uh, no. But, uh, but, but John was writing in the 60s just after the deaths of, of Paul and Peter. In order to address these issues and to give an authoritative teaching to the churches of that day, and I think we see several clues that reveal John's purpose, even in this prologue to his gospel. We also see John's emphasis on Jesus' teaching concerning unity uh, in John 17, pointing to the fact that truth was being compromised early on in these churches and was creating division where there should be unity. And I think that was a serious problem in these early churches. These churches were meant to proclaim the truth of Jesus, not the supposed enlightened knowledge of the Gnostic teachers who said, we have a secret knowledge that you Christians don't have and you need to know our secret knowledge. And the arrogance of these teachers uh, was leading to arrogance and division and a lack of love within these Christian congregations. And John had to address this issue. Christians were badly divided on something as basic as biblical doctrine. And even today, the church tends to de-emphasize the importance of biblical doctrine. And, uh, and it creates a sense of disunity where certain theological positions strive for preeminence, which is what was going on in the early church with these Gnostic teachers, or where doctrine is devalued to the extent that no one really cares about it anymore. And we say, doctrine doesn't make any difference. It does make a difference. That's why John was writing 
this gospel is because doctrine makes a difference. Both of these attitudes, either battling over theological positions or devaluing theological positions or teaching, both of those positions are destructive to what the church was designed to be. And Jesus came to form a church that would love each other, that would bring evidence of a purposeful unity and be sanctified and set apart to biblical truth as Jesus taught it. Not as some Gnostic teacher claimed a vision and a word from God that God told me this is the way it is. And the church was to be set apart in biblical truth as Jesus had originally taught it to his apostles. In John 13, 34 and 35, this love was to be expressed in the church, and I think it was seriously threatened. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. In verse 35, he says, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And, and so John is challenging these churches, and he picks out this event, remembering the words of Jesus just before the crucifixion, this challenge to love one another. And I think with this division coming into the church, a doctrinal division, there was a lot of disunity going on in those churches that, that John was, was dealing with. In John 17 and verse 23, it says, uh, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. That's an indication that John was picking this statement of Jesus to address a disunity within the church. And it says that the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And so John is drawing a distinction between truth and non-truth, between truth and a lie, between true teaching and false teaching. Then in John 17 and, and verse 17, Jesus says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And that word sanctify means we're to be set apart in the truth as Jesus presented it. Not as in truth as we want it to be, but we are to be a people set apart, anchored in this apostolic truth that was presented to the churches and was being threatened in that day. So Jesus called his church to be unified in love, in purpose, and in truth. And as this was being threatened, it was up to John to speak into this confusing situation that was dividing and weakening the church and getting them off of their task of spreading the good news and the message of Jesus Christ. Now it's clear, therefore, that John wrote for a totally different primary purpose than the other gospel writers. That's why John is so different from the other gospels. He was writing for a different purpose. It is a theological gospel. And even in these first verses of his gospel, we see John pushing back against the popular cultural ideas of his day, the Greek teaching, the Gnostic teaching. And as I've said, the Greeks did not believe that God could ever take on human flesh. They said flesh and spirit could never inhabit one who professed to be God. And so they said Jesus cannot be God in human flesh. But John is telling us that God did just that. God inhabited human flesh. And he begins with a very Greek concept that had already been taught within that culture for several centuries. And, and John is attacking that idea head on. And he's, he's, he's using it because it's familiar to their cultural ears, but he's also going to shift it to a distinctively Christian understanding as he presents this. Uh, Heraclitus, or Herac Heraclitus, was an early Greek philosopher from Ephesus who first wrote about the idea of the Logos 500 years before John mentioned it here at the beginning of his gospel. The word Logos is here translated as the word. Heraclitus thought that the, the Logos was a principle of ordering the cosmos or the universe. Later, the Greek Stoics saw the Logos as a divine principle that permeated the universe. But for John, and this is what is so earth-shaking, the Logos is more than a principle or a force, as the Greeks taught. John is saying the Logos 
is a person, Jesus, who was present at creation as the creative word of God. Notice in verses 1 and 2, in the beginning was the word or the logos, and the word logos was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now, John then is pushing back, back against the Greek idea that the universe itself is eternal and telling us as his readers that only God is eternal and that Jesus is God. The verb that that John uses here is the Greek verb for being, and it indicates that Jesus uh, simply is. Uh, And this is in contrast with all that uh, is in the sense of becoming that we find in verse 3. John changes verbs by verse 3. He moves from a form of a meing, is or being, to ginomai, which is become or come to exist. So he's using two different verbs to communicate this idea. And Jesus, therefore, in using that first verb, he's saying Jesus had no beginning, and he is as God is. He has eternal being in himself. That was what the Gnostics were were, saying. challenging. Now we see this same thing throughout John's gospel when Jesus uses a a form of this verb in the seven I am statements that point us back to the use of this in the first two verses. What are the names of Jesus in the gospel of John? Remember the seven I am statements? Those are verbs of being. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. All of those things is saying that's a part of the eternal nature of Christ and that he is God in in human flesh. Now, when John uses that term, he's leaping all the way back to Exodus chapter 3. When when Moses asked God, he says, you've got a task for me. Who shall I say has sent me? And what does God say to Moses? Moses. He says, tell them, I am has sent you. I am is sending you to the world. Now, Jesus is identifying with that statement in Exodus 3. And and all the way through John's gospel, in all of those I am statements, Jesus is repeatedly saying, I am God in human skin. John then is telling us that Jesus is is a preexistent being and therefore is the eternal God who exists before all things. You know, we're reminded of Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 where where, uh, it says, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, uh, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, but Mighty God, this one who's coming. So Isaiah had already promised that this one who's coming will be the Mighty God. And he'll be coming in human skin. So Isaiah had already prophesied that. God had already promised that. And we see that in verse 3. In verse 3, it says, Through him, the logos, the uncreated, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Okay? So... Notice here that there's a a word here in verse 3. Through him, all things were made. Now, John is also pushing back against this Greek philosophy by that simple word, all. Because one of the things that the Gnostic teachers were saying, they referred to this idea of the all. Okay? Now, uh, and it's identifying all things as God. Now, we see that in a lot of our New Age philosophy today, that you are God, that rock is God, that tree is God, all things are God. That is a Gnostic idea that really we see within, in many places within our our culture. But it's an idea within the New Age movement today. But John refers to all things. 
through him all things were made. And so John is purposely separating the uncreated God from his creation, and he says they're not the same thing. He does not allow the universe to be eternal since God alone is eternal. He's drawing that distinction between the creator uh, who is uh, eternal and the creation that exists within time. John then is also undermining the philosoph philosophical roots of modern evolutionary thought. And we think evolution came along back in, what, around the 1860s with Darwin? Evolution was taught by Aristotle. It's not a new idea, people. It's an ancient idea that the universe itself is eternal and that there is no God who created. It's just everything is, is God. And Aristotle taught that in, in the 4th century B.C., now, as I've already said, there's a reason that John is the most theological of the Gospels, okay? But all of this is for a reason. John had a purpose in writing this Gospel. Finally, and, and you, again, shout hallelujah, to return to this Greek idea of the inability of the spiritual to ever interact with the material world and the impossibility of God ever taking on flesh as the Gnostics taught, John makes it absolutely clear that God, who is spirit, took on human flesh. The one who is outside of time entered into time. The one who is uncreated entered into the realm of that which is created. And spirit and flesh interacted in Christ. And so John is saying we are truly in Jesus seeing God in human skin, something that these false teachers said could never happen. Now, that's what John is saying in verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And in his letters, John tells us also that this idea is central to discerning whether a teacher was offering real apostolic truth in that day or a mere Gnostic claim to truth. He said, if you start hearing that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, he said, they're a Gnostic teacher. Boot them out of your house. He said, don't let them come in and teach in the midst of your home or in the midst of your particular house church. Uh, he says, don't give them a hearing. Now, we see that in 1 John, in 1 John 2, 26, where John writes, I am writing these things uh, to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. In uh, 1 John 4, 1 and 2, he says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So John is recognizing there's false teaching that's all around us. Be careful. In verse 2, he said, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. That idea was very central to what John was saying, that somehow spirit and matter have come together, and we no longer devalue the material body but the material body is inhabited by the spiritual and eternal God presence. Now, let me also mention that the Gnostics claimed that truth could come from many sources. Now, that's also much like our uh, own postmodern conception of truth. We have moved into postmodernism in the last 20 years, but it was very similar to what the ancient world said as well. The Gnostics also believed that there were many gods to be worshipped and uh, we only needed to pick one out of an impressive list of gods. And it really didn't matter in the long run anyway. Doctrine doesn't make any difference. That's what the Gnostics were saying. John, however, tells us that Jesus alone is truth and that he alone is God. 
Jesus is not one who possesses a portion of grace and truth offered through the many gods. And you just pick each individual god and you get a little bit of grace from that one. And there's some good in every god. That was sort of their idea. But John says he, Jesus, is full of grace and truth. He's using another Gnostic word and redefining it. And he's pushing back against these Greek ideas. And he says, uh, Jesus is full of grace and truth. And he is saying there's no need for any other God or any other truth. That means that as Christians, there is a, there is a set-apart nature of loyalty to that truth that we looked at earlier. And, and John is saying we need not waste time in a restless seeking for truth because he says we have found it in Jesus. And that's what drives the world crazy in a postmodern world when Christians say we've found the truth. And the world wants to just be in an endless searching for truth. And we have the goal to say we've found it. And in many cases, that's why they hate us. Now, so John says, Jesus is full of grace and truth. He sang as one of the songs that they sang this morning, he's enough. He is enough. We don't need to go searching everywhere. For Gnostic teachers, for people who claim to have some enlightened truth, Jesus and his truth is enough. And we've got to learn it in our day. We've got to learn it all over again. All mercy is found in him. All grace is found in him. All truth is found in him. All salvation is found in him. And all of life, now and for eternity, is found in him. Jesus is enough. That's what John was saying in this gospel. Jesus said the same thing in John 14, 6, when he told Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life, and I'm enough, Thomas. God has come, and he lives in human skin. He lived among us, and now he lives within us through his spirit. In verse 14, it says, the word became flesh and has made his dwelling among us. He has tabernacled or tented. He is present, and now he is present within us as the people of God. In John 14 and verses 16 and 17, there he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. And, and he, Jesus goes on in that passage, and he says, The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he lives with you. And John and Jesus looking ahead says, and he will be in you. You see, we are the recipients of that promise of Jesus in our day. Now, in light of all that John is telling us, he is telling us one more thing. Just as God the Father sent the Son to reveal who he is, and redeem sinful men from their slavery to sin, so he has also sent us. We read that verse just as we commissioned Alan and Miriam this morning. <clears throat> so Jesus sends us as the Father sent him to live our lives before men that they might see Jesus and that we might go with the message of salvation to all men, that they might know that they can possess eternal life in this one God in human skin who came to die for us in order that we might have life, life now and life forever in him. In John 10, 10, Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And these false teachers were really bringing destruction in their path. But Jesus says, I've come that you as Christians might have life to the fullest extent. In John 20 and verse 31, he says, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And these false teachers had nothing of life to offer. 
because life can only flow from the one who is the eternal source of life. And because Jesus is God, only he can bring that life to fallen, sinful, dead men. So as Jesus revealed the Father, we are to reveal Jesus to the world in all things. As Jesus was God in human skin, so we are to be Jesus to the world around us. Remember this. <clears throat> when you love, love as Jesus loved. And when you serve, serve as Jesus served. Let your joy be his joy. Let your obedience reflect his obedience. And let your mission be his mission. And be Jesus in human skin. Let's bow together in prayer. Our Father, we thank you. And as God came in human skin, you call us to live out our lives before a watching world to serve in the same way you served, to fulfill mission in the same way you came to on a mission to us, to love in the way you have first loved us. <clears throat> and Lord, as we look at this gospel of John, we thank you for the depth of this gospel that sometimes it's, it seems almost impossible to plumb its depths. But Lord, we thank you for the moving of your spirit to inspire that apostle, to bring us a fuller presentation of this deep truth that stands against all the popular philosophies of the culture around us. Lord, help us see the distinctiveness of your word. And Lord, as we rest and are sanctified and set apart in that truth, I pray, Lord, that people would realize as Jesus was God in human skin, that people would see Jesus living in us. And Lord, we thank you now and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.